Thank you. So obviously we made a bunch of uh, pretty significant announcements today around Terraform and Console. And I wanted to maybe just step back a minute and provide a bit of context to what it is we're trying to do as an organization. I think, uh, you know, I think as, as Armon highlighted, whether by accident or by design, we live in a multi-infrastructure world. And our mission is to enable consistency around how you interact with those core principles of, of that modern infrastructure stack. So I think if you think about what we've done actually collectively over the world of uh, infrastructure provisioning over the last couple of years, it's actually kind of astounding to see the progress that Terraform has, has, uh, has made. And honestly, we do some of it, but many of you in the room do much of the rest of it, where today not only is Terraform sort of the sort of in some sense a standard way for interfacing to how you provision infrastructure on Amazon, Amazon or Azure or, or Google or even Alibaba or vSphere. Um, the inventory of providers outside of those cloud providers is actually kind of amazing. I think there are 250 plus distinct uh, providers in the Terraform ecosystem. And all you need to do is spend a couple of seconds on the GitHub repo to see the velocity of how those are evolving. I usually actually, in some of our customer meetings, I open up a browser and say, listen, I think uh, if you want to see what a vibrant community looks like, just spend 30 seconds refreshing your browser in the GitHub repo for the Terraform providers. Literally every 10 seconds, something new is being updated and it's being done by you. What that allows is for you not just to configure the infrastructure on Amazon or on Azure uh, in a consistent way, but you can now configure the dependencies associated with your infrastructure stack because Terraform's templating mechanism allows you that, that single language for really everything that you need to provision. Uh, that's super cool for us to see and we're super grateful for the work that the community does. The second principle, as Armand talked about, is in the world of identity-based security. I think the notion of identity as the basis for who can access what and what machines can access what inside the data center uh, is a pretty profoundly clear thing that we've all understood in the world of sort of users accessing machines and you know, whether it's uh, Okta or the like um, for the user use case. For the machine use case, I think this general uh, sort of harmonization around the identity-based model for machines is one that really has taken hold and many of the most sophisticated applications on the planet use Vault uh, to underpin this process. And the model's super cool for us because what you see is, given the, the modular nature of it, much like Terraform, really on the left-hand side, any authentication mechanism that you're interested in, whether it's LDAP or Active Directory or Azure Active Directory, uh, can be loaded as a backend. And then you can really connect literally any system uh, that you like. Again, you know, if you watch the repo of, uh, of system backends on GitHub for Vault, you'll see that literally any system you want to apply this principle to is available to you. And that only happens by virtue of having an enormous community of people collaborating in the open source to make this happen. The next bit, and you've seen, if you've been focusing on what we've been uh, really announcing, and it's not just Mitchell that's been talking about, about this, although he's been the, the, the face of the last couple of conferences. This notion of networking is a profoundly difficult thing in the cloud model. I think those of us that have been looking at this for a while, you sort of stare at it and go, hold on a second. In the cloud model, the application elements are coming to us in much smaller pieces, largely in the form of containers. Number two, they're ephemeral by design, which means they're gonna scale up and scale down. That means they have different IP addresses every time they come and go. So it's, in a sense, implausible for a human to reason over the firewall rules associated with those applications. That's why for most of our customers, actually the networking challenge is the biggest challenge for applications actually seeing traffic after they're deployed, just because of the firewall realities of that. It sort of stands to reason the same way we went to identity as the basis for security in the machine sense. You sort of have to inevitably go to service name as the basis for routing in the, uh, in the networking sense. The service mesh use case is sort of a derivative of that, but step one, and the reason that Consular is by far our most widely deployed, deployed product as a company, uh, not always that well known, is because you kind of need to create this common registry that tells you where everything is. When I deploy a new application into that world, it updates the registry, and then I can do derivative things from that. Now route from service A to service B. You know, and then the more extreme use case that there's a lot of light and heat around, the service mesh use case is about now enforced encryption when those things actually speak. But the higher level construct of service networking to us uh, just feels, in a sense, inevitable, and that's why we spend so much time and energy on this, and it's why console is an enormous investment for us, and it's super fun for us to see it get used. Because I think, I think what we all 
in this room recognize is that the shift to cloud is not just a shift in dropping an artifact somewhere new. It's actually a completely different way of building and delivering applications because what you're now doing is you're dropping that application artifact into a low trust network that has no clear network perimeter, that is ephemeral by design. And that causes all the participants in the IT chain to have to rethink how they do their job, which is why Armin described it uh, in the layer view that we did earlier. We have the benefit of speaking with literally hundreds of companies around the world on a, on a weekly basis. And I think the pattern that we see most often is actually played back to us. This is not something we prescribed initially, but this is what we, we, we observed maybe a year and a half ago. People are standing up Terraform as a central shared service for their organization, and then they're telling their application teams, if you want to go to cloud, I'm giving you one aperture. Nobody else gets the credentials to Amazon or Azure. I'm going to control it through a single set of templates that are pre-approved. If you use Terraform and the central shared service to Terraform as the basis for those applications getting deployed, you can deploy 100 times a day, knock yourself out. At the security layer, again, we see people building the central shared service around Vault to use this identity-based notion First of all, to enforce access to system secrets, but ultimately to enable encryption and advanced data protection use cases around those applications in the cloud model. And they say, if you reach back to Vault for your credentials, you can deploy your app 100 times a day, right? I'm getting out of your way. You've been, I'm sort of giving you my implicit sign off for you to deliver that application to that cloud world. At the networking layer, again, if they say, hey, if you want that application artifact to see traffic when it gets there, we need to have a sign off previously that says you're going to include console client in that application element when it goes. I will run a central shared service for console server so that then when that element lands in the, in, in the cloud model, whether it's you know, on-prem or whether it's Azure, um, I will route traffic to it straight away because I will discover it. And now I will actually optionally encrypt it. And with the, the service on Azure, it gets even easier because now that can be set up for you. But that model just makes a ton of sense. So whether it's a Java app, a .NET app, a Cloud Foundry app, a Kubernetes app, a Nomad scheduled app, it doesn't really matter. So when we talk about the cloud model, uh, this is sort of what we refer to because the consistency that we get to see as a vendor is on how all of our customers end up deploying our products, and this is what it looks like. The other really cool thing for us is that you all are at the center of this. You're the ones that are, that are sharing with your organizations the realities of what it means to deliver applications in the cloud world. You're the ones that are providing this critical enabling role. Our role and our commitment to you is to continue to deliver these tools using the open source model. We think this is the way we can aggregate enormous communities together to make this all work for all of us. Number two, our commitment is to build commercial versions of these projects because we recognize that you know, an individual's technical need to provision 100,000 machines on Azure is different from the challenge of a team or an organization that has to work uh, with that tech. It's kind of like going from Git to GitHub in a sense, right? The team problem is one of collaboration. The organization problem is one of governance and policy associated with that provisioning process. That is something that our customers have brought to us as a requirement, and that is where we build our commercial products. The third element that we're committed to is to continue to invest in the organization to deliver on the trust that you implicitly place in us when we play that role. When you commercially partner with us, it allows us to invest back in the ecosystem, build better documentation, build our products, partner with bigger organizations to allow you to do uh, what it is you do, uh, and that is build mission critical applications every day. Obviously, we couldn't do this by ourselves. We have an enormous ecosystem of partners that we work with. I think it's particularly cool that we have Amazon, Google, Azure, and VMware as, as platinum sponsors at this event, which I think is indicative of the role that our products enable uh, for those companies uh, and essentially reduce the friction to the consumption of those platform technologies uh, for, for all of us. But obviously beyond that, there's an enormous ecosystem of people uh, that, that uh, I would highly encourage you to take a look at downstairs in the, in the partner uh, pavilion in particular. If you're running cloud infrastructure, I'm almost certain that these companies are of interest to you. Uh, and obviously we have an enormous ecosystem behind this. Maybe, just in closing, I kind of want to step back even further. And I think, I think our central view is that the infrastructure that we provide uh, enables some of the most sophisticated applications on the planet to be built. Right? That is a super fun role for us to play. We take it incredibly seriously, um, but you're the ones driving the change. Uh, we're here to help you, and I just want to take a moment to say thank you for, for all the support that you give us. Uh, 
this is a really, really fun thing for us to do to see, when we talked to customers yesterday, just for, as an example, you get to see how significant these products are in the runtime of some of the most important applications on the planet.